It is so great to be back with you. Amy and I were so excited for today, not just because it's Mother's Day, but because we love Saddleback. We love you. Uh, you may not have known this, but uh, many of you did. A few months ago, Amy and I felt the Lord leading us to a new season of ministry out of Saddleback into something new. We called our Abraham moment where it was go to a land I will show you. And we know many of you have been praying for us and we appreciate those prayers. Keep them coming. You know, with the Lord, it's always an adventure. And so we just appreciate as we pray for you as well. And so we love you and Saddleback will always be home. So we've been in this series on margin and I love this series for a number of reasons because it's making space for the things in life. It's not redlining it. It's not blowing past our limits. Margin is not just so we can be more productive and certainly you know, margin helps us have less stress and be more efficient, but it's just a time management strategy. It's a tool. It's a tool that we employ to help corral the busyness and craziness of life from taking over. You know, no one wakes up in the morning and says, hey, I finally figured out the dream for my life. I'm gonna work really hard, burn out by 30, hurt a lot of people around me. I think that sounds like a good plan, right? When it comes to margin, nobody wakes up and thinks that. No, people, it just happens, it creeps in. Life takes over, we get super busy, our priorities get out of whack. And so margin is a life management tool that helps us to ensure that we prioritize and keep the main thing the main thing. Now, in spite of our best efforts, we still fail. And there's nothing like the, just the, the humor of a child to remind us of even when we're trying really hard for something about what's most important. My wife uh, bought a chalkboard, and it's a great size chalkboard that sits over our kitchen table, and she bought this chalkboard so that we, she could write verses on it for us as a family to look at and to talk about, and she painstakingly writes these verses, and I mean painstakingly. Her handwriting is like hieroglyphics, okay? It's like, is that an R or a bird? What is that? I don't know what I'm reading there. I can't tell what it is. And so she writes these verses up there, and our family talks about it. So she just, she found a verse, it was Philippians 4a, it's a great verse, whatever is honorable and right and pure and lovely, think on these things. And so she wrote it up there, I mean, she really worked hard on it. And so the kids were excited, we sit down to to dinner, it's a brand new verse, and we're reading it, and we're talking about it, we're having these deep spiritual conversations, and so for us as parents, we're like, hey, we're we're doing pretty good, check this out, and our kids are talking about scripture, we're talking about memorizing it, so we're feeling pretty good about ourselves. And then a few days later, we sit down to dinner, And we look up at the verse, and as we look up the verse, we notice the verse has changed just a little bit. And so we we go through, we start reading it, and my nine-year-old son, Caleb, snuck in when we weren't looking, and he put these uh, very life-giving, loving words at the bottom of the verse to add to the verse. Let's take a look at this. Uh, I have a but. (laughs) <laughs> so you read, honorable, right, pure, lovely, and admirable. Think about all these things. It's excellent, worthy, and praise. And I have a but. Philippians 4, 8. <laughs> well, we did what you did. We started laughing. And, and, uh, and, but see, the thing is, though, you know, we, we could have freaked out as parents. We could have been like, oh, no, he's defiled scripture. What are we going to do, right? Like, we could have, like, freaked out in that moment. Well, we didn't. And these verses, you know, they stay up on the board for weeks. And so we didn't erase it or anything. It just stayed up there, Philippians 4.8. You know, all these great things. And I have a but. So now every time I think of Philippians 4.8, I think I have a but. I just, I can't help it. It's in my head. You know, sometimes as parents, we think that there's some things that are more important than they really are. And it's not just parenting. We do this in all areas of life, don't we? We, we our priorities, you just think, oh no, that's urgent. That's, we need to do that. Uh, we have five alarm fires that we think are five alarm fires that are not. Uh, we, we let the world tell us what's most important. And what I love about today is we're gonna actually unpack that. What is the most important thing in life? If it's, it's your first time here at Saddleback, we're so glad that you came here. Uh, on this Mother's Day weekend. Moms, we love you and, and, uh, and we're glad that you're here and we want you to know that we're actually gonna answer what the most important thing in life is all about. So go ahead and pull out your outlines if you haven't done that already. <clears throat> Let's take a look at this. <clears throat> what is the most important thing in life? And we're gonna, we're gonna answer that question right off the bat. Number one, live a life of love. The most important thing in life is to live a life of love. Now you might look at this and say, oh, that's great, you know, but how do you know that, Tommy? I mean, there's a lot of important things in life. That's a nice hippie sentiment to live a life of love here. But how do I know that that's what's most important? Because in my life, I've got a lot of important things. Well, I'm glad you asked that question because there's a little story in scripture, it's about five verses that gives us the key to the Christian life. 
And here's what happened. This is in the New Testament. There was a teacher of the law that came up to Jesus and he had an opportunity to ask Jesus a question. Now think about this for a moment. If you had an opportunity to sit down with God over coffee and ask him one question, what would you ask him? I know for me, I would have a lot, of, a lot of questions I love to ask. Like, God, why did that happen to me back then? The way whatever happened, why'd that, why'd that happen to me? Uh, or what am I gonna do with the rest of my life? I, I know I have a ton of questions and I'm sure you would as well, but let's just suppose for a moment you had one shot and one question to ask Jesus. What would you ask him? Now, I, didn't, I wouldn't have asked this question, but I'm so glad this guy was here and he asked the question that he did because he basically said this to Jesus. Jesus, would you please tell me what is the most important thing in life? And here's how Jesus answered. Look at your outline, Mark 12. Jesus responded this way. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength and love your neighbor as yourself. There are no commandments more important than these. Take out a pen, underline that last part or highlight, whatever you need to do, there are no commands more important than these. Jesus is saying, hey, look, there's, a, there's one thing that's important in life. It's this, right? You ready? Here it is. It's to love me and it's to love others. And there's a third part too, and this is hard for some of us, and that is to learn to love yourself because God thinks you're amazing. He said, this is what's most important in life is loving me and loving others. Another passage in the New Testament, Jesus goes on to, to add this to it in John 13. He says, so now I'm giving you a new commandment, a new one. Love each other just as I have loved you, and you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. You know, some of the reasons that we're so driven and we get burnout, and I've been on the verge of burnout a number of times in my life, or while we walk around feeling so empty inside, or we have loneliness or the regrets, is because we're using the wrong measuring stick for when it comes to what success really, truly looks like. So what does that mean exactly? What it means when you wake up in the morning, you make a decision, and the decision is this, no matter what happens today, no matter what my to-do lists are or how good or bad a day it is, it doesn't matter, as long as I learn to love God a little bit more and I learn to love others, then that day was a great day. The Bible says that day was the best day. Now the opposite is true as well, which is if you wake up in the morning and you're not even thinking about God, and you say, I gotta, I gotta get going, man. I gotta get out there. I gotta make the sale. I gotta make the grade. And let's say for you, it was the best day ever. Maybe you got the promotion. Maybe you did get the sale. Maybe you finally got a date with a live girl, whatever it may be, okay? <laughs> it was the best day for you. And it's not that all those things were bad or wrong. They're good. But let's say you didn't learn to love God a little bit more or learn to love others or even understand to learn how much he really loves you then God says, you know what, that wasn't the best day. That was an okay day, it was a mediocre day and the fact that I've got something better for you. You know, when we derail our lives and all of us, all of us derail our lives at one point or another, all of us get our priorities mixed up and, and twisted around upside down, God doesn't look at you in anger, upset, he looks at you with compassion. And he says, okay, that's all right, it's okay. We'll try it again tomorrow. Tomorrow you'll get another shot at it because this is important to me. That this is what God says, this is important to me that you get this right. And so, yeah, all these things were great, but I've got a better way for you to live. And that's the heart of God towards you. He wants to give you the best day ever. And he wants to have a better way for you to live. And that's to live a life of love. Look at 1 Corinthians 16, 14. Everything you do must be done in love. Everything. So the primary call in the life of a believer is to live a life of love. It's putting relationships before activities, not just building wealth, not getting to the best schools, not getting married, not landing the best jobs, nothing wrong with all that, but it's not the priority, it's not what's important. So when we fail to build margin in our lives, we start skimming, and we skim. The first place we normally skim is in relationships because we get overloaded. And God says, let love be your highest priority. Make life about relationships, not about accomplishments. So now when it comes to love, though, and we look at our world, and our world defines love in a lot of different ways, doesn't it? And when we think about love, there's a lot of definitions and a lot of different voices coming in saying, hey, this is what love is. But when we're talking about love, we need to remember number two, write this down, let God define what love is. We need to let God define what love is, not the world. Now the world talks a big talk about love, doesn't it? 
I mean, there's millions of books and movies and songs. Oh, we love our songs. Oh, we have love songs in our hearts. We have breakup songs too, don't we? Right? We have love songs and breakup songs, and we love our love songs, and we love songs about love. And I know that all of us are probably thinking of some songs. Let's, let's, uh, let's do a, a, a fun little thing here. Fill in, fill in this for me. You two's got a song that says, in the name of what? <laughs> love, right? And all you need is what? Love. And what's love got to do with it? God would say love's got everything to do with it, okay? Everything. We love love, don't we? I mean, we have a day dedicated to celebrating love on Valentine's Day. Uh, And this weekend is about moms, but it's about telling mom that we love her. But all you have to do is turn on the news channel or pull up a news app or read the newspaper or something online, and you realize that the human race isn't very loving, in fact, we're not very good at it. We love love, but we don't, we're not really good at doing it. And so we shouldn't be the ones to define what love is. So where does it come from then? Well, here's what the Bible says in 1 John 4, 7. Love comes from God, for God is love. God is the author and the creator of love. God just doesn't have love. He is love. Love, it's his nature, it's his core. If you could open up God, you can't, but if you could open up God, you would see at his core and his nature is love. And he gives you and I the capacity and the ability to love other things and other people. And we love a lot of things, don't we? I mean, we can, and we have the ability just to love things. Some things that are good, some things that are bad, some things that are strange, but we can, we can love people, we can love ice cream, we can love puppies, we can love unicorns, we can love Netflix. Like we can love anything. It's just because we've got the capacity and the ability to love. But at our nature, it's not who we are, but it is at God's nature. God invented love. He's the one who invented it. It's who he is at his core. And so we should let him define it and tell us what love is all about. Now, the great thing is, is that he didn't want us to wonder about it, so he gave us a chapter in the Bible to define what love is. It's called the love chapter. And it's found in 1 Corinthians 13. It's probably one of the most famous Bible chapters when it comes to weddings. In fact, by show of hands, how many of you have either been to a wedding or maybe at your own wedding, you you heard this read or it was written down or you've seen on a pillow or some sort of Christian tchotchke? I mean, they're everywhere, right? Raise your hand, okay? Yes, yes, it's a very famous passage and it's a great passage and it is fitting because it describes what love is. So I want us to read read this together if you look down your outline. Let's read it out loud together. Here we go. Love is patient, love is kind, love does not envy, love does not boast, love is not proud, love does not dishonor others, love is not self-seeking, love is not easily angered, love keeps no records of wrongs, love does not delight in evil, love rejoices with the truth, love always protects, love always trusts, love always hopes, Love always preserves. Love never fails. What a beautiful passage. And when you look at this, you're going, yeah, that's so great. But how in the world do I do that as a person? I mean, I can barely, I can barely make this happen in my own life. I'm barely patient with myself. And what a standard to live to. I mean, my pride gets the best of me. I keep track of my own failures and my own mistakes. And the truth is, by ourselves, we can't love like this because our love is flawed. And so the answer to be able to love like this is understanding that it starts with knowing who God is and who God is to you. This chapter isn't just a chapter about love that's read at weddings. It's actually a chapter to describe how God thinks about you and who God wants to be to you and how God loves us. In fact, everywhere you see the word love, let's replace it with the word God. And read it a different way. You ready? I'll read it. You don't have to. Just listen. God is patient with you. The Bible says that we are but dust and God knows that. And that we struggle and he is patient with us. God is kind to you. He loves you. God does not envy. God does not boast. God is not proud. Unless he's talking about you. He thinks you're pretty amazing. God does not dishonor others. God is not self-seeking. God is not easily angered with you. God keeps no records of wrongs because Jesus paid for all of it on the cross. God does not delight in evil. 
or the evil that happens to you. God rejoices with the truth. God always protects you even when you may not realize it. God always trusts. God always hopes because he is hope. God always perseveres. And God never fails you. That's who God is. And that's who God wants you to, to understand about him. This is his heart towards you. When he looks at you, this is how he looks at you. When he thinks about you, this is how he thinks about you. He wants to relate to you in this way. He wants you to know this is how he responds to you. So the next time you go around thinking and getting down on yourself that maybe God is punishing you or that God is upset at you or that God doesn't like you or that God, for some reason, he's out to get you, think about this passage as a filter to understand and to see who God is to you. God is patient and kind and loving and he will never, ever, ever fail you. And he loves you with an everlasting, never-ending love. This is his heart towards you. Now, here's the best news. Since this is who God is and this is his heart towards us, as believers, when we receive Jesus into our, in our hearts, the Holy Spirit, his spirit, God's spirit, this is so amazing, comes and lives inside of you. This is the coolest thing ever. God is living inside of you. He takes up residence inside of you. And because he is love and he, this is who he is in his nature, he takes up residence inside of you. It now gives you the ability and the capacity to love the way God loves so you don't have to do it on your own power because we will run out of it. We will run out of love, but God never runs out of love. He never will. So when you're struggling with someone, ask God, ask God to fill you with his love. First John 4, 16 says, we know and rely on the love God has for us. So when you wonder what do you do in this situation, how to be more loving, you know, how can I forgive this person who's hurt me or how can, I, how can I be more loving in a situation with my family or at work, you go back and you realize that this passage, like this is what God wants us to be with each other in our families, in our marriages, at our work environments, with other people, with strangers, that we are to be the people of love. Amy's gonna come now and she's gonna talk about the third thing we need to remember when it comes to love. Isn't she lovely? Hi. <laughs> You're not. Okay, so we're talking about how to live a lifestyle of love, but we can't just sit around a campfire and hug each other and sing kumbaya. Uh, there's work to get done. So what about work? Where does it fit in into this whole conversation? I've got things to do. Mama's gotta get things done. And I know you do too. And sometimes when we talk about this lifestyle of love, work and ambition, they get a really bad rap. They kind of get this, we have this mentality sometimes that rest and recreation and relationship, like that is living. And then work is this necessary evil that we just endure so that we can get to the real aspects of life. But actually that is not a biblical perspective about work. From a biblical perspective, work is good. God created it from the very beginning, it's been a part of creation from the very start. It's meant to be a meaningful and fruitful part of our lives. But unfortunately, because sin entered the world, that work has become harder. And it doesn't often yield the results that it should. And that's an unfortunate part of work on this planet. But work, when placed in the life of a believer and empowered by the Holy Spirit, can become a holy thing. It can become a really beautiful act of worship. And one of life's greatest thrills, we all know, is to be able to do something that we have been created to do. To, when you're working in your most itself, the, the fulfillment that comes from that is real. But all we have to do is look back in scripture, roll it back to Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, and we see how God sets up work in the life of Adam. And so Adam, if you imagine, has been placed in this beautiful garden, and he's been given the very coolest and the most premier job on the planet. He is caring for this incredible garden that he and God live in together. And he's naming plants and he's naming animals and there is no other job on the planet that is this high level. He is top dog, he is the one in charge, there's nobody above him, he's calling the shots. The only person above him is the creator of the universe. He has tons to do, he's not short on work. The man can't possibly get bored and yet slowly, he gets into this gig and he starts feeling the discontent. 
He feels like something's missing and he can't quite put his finger on it because he doesn't know, but something just doesn't feel right. Cue the creation of a woman. And I love that Eve comes onto the scene at this point in the story. I love it because it's like God kind of lets Adam flounder a little bit so that he never, ever, ever, ever forgets that no job, no authority, no position, no power, no rule, no task, no to-do list is gonna even come close to the love of a woman. <laughs> Nothing is gonna come close. Ultimately, work failed Adam in fulfillment. Ultimately, he needed a loving relationship. And this is what brings us to number three. Number three on your outline is let love define your priorities. Our work is good, but it's not the thing that will ultimately fulfill us. Loving relationships are where the meaning is at. They're the primary source of our meaning. So what does it look like to let love define your priorities? Well, let love be the lens that when you're sitting down with your calendar, however you manage your time, that you're letting love be the lens through which you organize your days. Let love be the organizer of your time and your energy. Let love be calling the shots on what gets the lion's share of your attention. Thinking about placing things on your calendar in such a way that you think that love gets the first slots. It's the first thing you're taking care of. 1 Corinthians 14, one says, let love be your highest goal. If we really lived this way, it would be just totally radical. We would be a little bit like hippies, and I'm okay with that. But if we really put love as the highest goal, not like here, not like here, but like way up here, what would that look like? It's really easy for us to get out of balance. I get it, life is demanding and it moves quickly and there's so much to do and love just isn't always our first priority. An example of this in my own life right now is that about eight o'clock every night is the time of the day where my mom game is in the toilet. It, I just, I've got nothing left. I'm ready to be alone with a good book and a, cuzzy, and a fuzzy blanket. I don't wanna talk to anybody. I'm peopled out, I'm done. But ironically, this is when my teenagers and my tweens wanna talk the most. This is when they wanna process the great mysteries of life. And I am done with my day. And I'm having to learn, because they are my priority, how to reorganize my time, how to reprioritize how I manage my days, what part of the day I'm getting filled up, when do I find time for myself, where do I replenish, and so that I'm emotionally available for the people who matter the most to me. Now, I don't do this great. In fact, if you were to ask my kids on the patio, they would probably tell you, eh, you know, she's kind of working at it. And that's the truth. But that's the beauty of being a part of the kingdom of God, is that we just get to keep practicing. We just get to keep trying over and over again. We're no longer condemned. We're completely forgiven. And so everything now in the life of the believer is about practicing who we are in Christ. And so we don't have to bemoan and you know, whip ourselves and be depressed about it. We just get to practice again. There's no condemnation and we're not short on days. We have from here on into eternity to keep practicing this. So that's what I'm doing, I'm practicing. Maybe I'll get a little bit better at it this week. And I like to think of this kind of work-love balance more with the word rhythm, a work-love rhythm. Um, when you think about balance, you think about how hard it is to balance. I mean, if you think if you've ever stood on a surfboard or a skateboard or a hoverboard or a balance beam, you know that your focus is on staying upright on whatever it is you're standing on, right? That is where all of your focus is. And good luck trying to multitask, because the minute you try to multitask, you're off balance. But rhythm is a less defeating way for me. It may be a tomato tomato thing, but thinking about life in rhythm is less defeating to me. It feels more attainable. When you look at the definition of rhythm, it's a strong, regular, repeated pattern of movement or sound. We just keep working at this rhythm. If we lose the pattern for a bit, okay. We learn it and get back into it and we try again. Balance is harder than rhythm, but that's okay because rhythm is better. One of my favorite verses in scripture is Colossians 3.23. It says, whatever you do, 
Work at it with all of your heart as working for the Lord and not for human masters. It's that word whatever, circle on your outline, whatever. I love that word whatever. There's just so much permission and freedom in it. So much um, creativity and space there. Now, of course, we're talking about whatever in the framework of following Christ. So it's not like you can like live a life of crime and follow Jesus, okay? So we're working within the framework of being a follower of Christ. But there is this whatever aspect. Like God wants you to do whatever it is he's created you to love. And so there's so much variety. But the point is that we're to do our work, whatever it is, with our hearts first, and do it for the Lord and not for people. And so whatever you do, whatever I do, can become an act of worship and an act of love when it's done with our hearts first. So on the back side, on the back side of your outline, we've been talking principally about what it means to make room for what matters most, but we wanna take a few minutes and talk about three practical ways that you can make space for love. And there are a lot of different ways. We're just gonna talk about three. But the first thing I want you to notice, when's the last time you saw pictures on your Saddleback outline? <laughs> I have to give props to Ashley Donahue, my sweet friend who drew these up for us. I'm visual, and so if I see a picture, it helps me remember it a little bit better. So we wanted to give you some visuals. So the first one there is to get filled up before you pour out. Get filled up before you pour out. Now we've got all these, these buckets, these love buckets, and those things are so leaky. No matter how many times we pour into them, they're leaking out. It's like the next day they need a fresh filling. You and I know we're supposed to be loving, and we know we're supposed to deal with people with a heart of love. But all it takes is having to deal with your kids at that eight o'clock hour and they're squabbling and you go for that love buck and it's like ready to pour on your kids and there's just, you know, drops, there's nothing there. When we try to love people on our own reservoir, on our own power, it is just exhausting. I exhaust myself, let alone you exhaust me. We just get so tired and we just have a limited amount. My own personal well is so tiny compared to the love of the Father, and his is just endless. Ephesians 3.18 says, and may you have the power to understand as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. Write this down on your outline. The starting place in living a life of love is being loved. The starting place of living a life of love is being loved. This is how you fill up, this is how I fill up. We get really acquainted, we get really up close and personal with God's love for us first. We rely on him to so fill us up that we can't help but spill out over all people. I think visually, and so I think of like, if there were like a little arrow meter that was just kind of slowly tickering up, you know, the top of my body, and that I imagine filling up slowly, that arrow moving up my body till it gets to the top, and now it's like overflowing, it's like shooting out my eyeballs and out my fingertips, and this, this aspect of living a life in Christ that is so filled up on the love of God that it can't help but just ooze out over everybody around us. This is what it means to be a follower of Jesus. No one should be safe, if you're a Christian, no one should be safe from getting loved on if you're around. This is the aspect of being in Jesus that we can't help but pour out his love because we feel so loved that everybody around us is like gonna get bombarded by love. I love thinking about love in this way because not only do we get to be a, a lover of God to other people, but 1 John 4, 19 says, we love because he first loved us. This is the best part. God loved us first. He's not waiting around for you to make the first move. It's not that you love God and God loves us back, that he's doing us a favor. God loved us first. He loved you first while you were messing up. He loved you first when you were ignoring him. He loved you first when you were messing around. He loved you first when you were apathetic. He lo loved you first when you ignored him. He loved you first when you made really poor choices. He loved you first when you didn't even know. He loved us first. God will, oh, amen. 
God will always be the initiator in your life. You will never take the first step towards God. God is forever the initiator in our lives. So he's always making the first move on you. He is all in from the very start. A teacher friend of mine says something profound. It takes God to love God. I love that thought because God is not gonna ask something of us that he's not gonna give us first. So he's gonna love me first so that I can love him back and I can love you and I can even love myself. So if God is love and he loved us first and it's always available to us, then why are so many of us walking around feeling unloved by God? Why is it so hard to access and have an experience of God's love? Well, there is a lot of reasons and honestly, that's a whole other message. But one primary barrier to experiencing the love of God is when we consciously or even unconsciously project our own imperfect human models of love on God. And it's only natural that we do this. It's really natural that we default to our most primary relationships as example of what it means to be loved. For some of us, that's a fabulous reference point. It's this strong, firm foundation that we can build a life of love off of. We can even understand, we have a great starting point in understanding who God is and who he wants to be for us. But then there's a lot of us who our foundation was flimsy and small and cracked and unreliable and unpredictable. And so trying to build something off of that foundation is really difficult. And if that is your story, I am so very sorry but the great news is, is that God is our firm foundation and we can build something fresh and new from the truth of God's love for us. There is no ending to the ability to restart and to fill up in a new way. I want you to think about how you can let God be God and let people be people. We have to let people be broken and messy and hurting and even hateful and sinful at some times. And we have to let God be God. Let him speak for himself. Let him be the one to define his character. Let him be the one to define what God's love is. Let him be the one to show you a new way. Getting your bucket filled up is being loved by your heavenly father. So how often do you and I need to fill up? Well, how often do you like feeling forgiven? How often do you like to feel that you're never alone? How often do you like to feel like you're totally adored and loved? How often do you like to know that there is power for you to live above your circumstances? How often do you love to know that you have an eternity that's planned for you and it's good? The more we consistently fill up, the more easily we'll be able to pour out. So try this. In the next week, take a little three by five card and maybe write a couple of verses that have been on this message or pick some other ones. And then write like a line on it about how God loves you. Maybe something like, I know that my heavenly father loves me, knows me, sees me, and is forever faithful to me, no matter how I feel in this moment. Or pray and ask the Lord to give you something different. He'll give you something good. But then tuck it into your pocket and pull it out multiple times a day. Or better yet, put multiple versions of that around your home, in your room, in your bedroom, on your car, on your dash. And just put it in front of your face. The whole point is that for you to be reminded consistently that your love source is God. And that there's nothing, absolutely nothing you can do that can separate you from it. And that he totally adores you and can't get enough of your face. He loves you. Try this for a couple weeks and see how it impacts your ability to love yourself and others and to love God back. The second thing that we can practice in making room for what matters most is to focus on faces over screens and voices over texts. Focus on faces over screens and voices over texts. This is a very concrete and practical way for us to make space for love in our lives. Now trying to find a scripture for screens and texts is a little difficult, but the principles of relationship that value people and the value presence are weaved all throughout scripture. Don't stop meeting together, bear with one another, love each other, look out for one another, go after each other, build one another up. It is all throughout scripture. And it seems like it's an obvious thing for us to talk about, right? Like 
Duh. Look at people's faces and use your voice. But the reality is this is getting harder and harder and harder for us to do these natural rhythms of relationship. And I'm not anti-technology. I, I love my iPhone. I love Amazon Prime. I love my handy-dandy apps. I, Netflix is great. So I love technology. But if I'm trying to live a lifestyle of love, if I'm honest, that sweet little screen is really self-defeating to a lot of my most important values. It's really easy for me to neglect people for technology. And that's so weird. I don't know how we've gotten to that place. Some of you might say, too late, it's normal, that's the way life's going. And I'll tell you what I say to my kids. Just because something is common doesn't mean it's normal and doesn't mean it's life-giving. So we have to, as a community, put technology in its proper place. We really need each other on this one. This can't be something that like I just do or my family does and five of our friends. As the body of believers, we have to do this together. We need to hold each other accountable to a different way. We can't just be going the way of culture. And we have to be willing to ask and say hard things like, hey, could you put your phone away, please? We're having dinner. And I know that is a really important phone call, but I was just in the middle of telling you this story. And hey, put that down. We have to hold each other accountable to this. We have to have more courage to actually say some of these things to each other. Author Jean Twenge, she's written a, a book recently called iGen, which is pretty insightful on the current um, youngest generation and, and how they're impacted by technology. And she says that we don't wanna become the kind of people that in 10 years we know the right kind of emoji to use in a conversation, but we have zero clue which facial expression. <laughs> We're getting weird. We already are there. So how do we resist the temptation to do what is easy? How do we as a kingdom people resist what is easy and go a different direction? We have to choose to not zone out on the couch on the latest Netflix binge and instead choose conversation. It may mean that I have to delay sharing my every thought about what happened in my day to actually wait, not text it, but have a conversation with my friend in person. It may mean that I have to avoid settling for virtual socialization and social media and instead make plans to meet somebody in real life. It may mean that we have to trade in a crowd of likers for just a few people who really love us. Now the younger you are, teenagers, I'm talking to you, the younger you are, the harder this is. This is so hard and honestly, it's not your fault. You've not known anything different and we adults have done a really terrible job of modeling for you what it looks like to handle technology in a life-giving way. So it's not like you know we taught you and you have ignored. You have had no clue and we've done a terrible job. So I want to implore you though, be better than us. Learn a new way. Practice something totally different, particularly if you call Jesus your savior. Because we are a kingdom people and we do it differently. The world may very much be going this way, but that doesn't mean that we should. We are to go and walk this direction. Romans 12, nine through 10 is such a great description. It says, don't pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. What a great passage for us to keep front and center. It's very easy today to slip into settling for a pretend love, for this contrived world of hearts and likes and retweets. But in the family of God, we're invited to do something totally different, so much better and so much more fulfilling. How about instead of Snapchatting your frustration, you actually call or meet with a person that you're frustrated with? How about instead of scrolling Instagram and watching other people's lives, you step out, take a risk, and invite somebody to hang out? How about instead of texting for an hour on the couch, you actually pick up and call somebody on the phone? I do the exact same thing. I'm like, how did I just escape having an hour conversation when I could have just easily have called? We're weird. It's gonna take courage. That's what's necessary for us to take these kinds of steps. And only those of us with our hearts set on bravery to live a different way are gonna be able to stand against this incredibly sweeping tide of culture that we cannot change. But that is exactly who the people of God are. We are light, 
We are lovers. We are meant to be the light and salt to the world. We're meant to be inviting the world to an alternative society where we live for something more, where we love each other, where we bend over backwards to serve each other, where we're for each other. Let's try it, guys. Let Tommy come and give you the third point on how to make room for what matters most. I love her so much. She's so amazing. Third thing we need to practice in our lives when it comes to what matters most is practicing presence over productivity. Number three, we need to practice presence over productivity. I want you to write this number down somewhere on your outline. Are you ready? 27,375. 27,375. That's the number of days that they say is the average lifespan of a human being. 27,375. Give or take a few years maybe for some of us. So what does that mean exactly? It means, well, if you are age 25, you have about 18,250 days left. If you are age 50, you have approximately 9,125 days left. If you're age 65, you have about 3,650 days left. Now, besides that being a little depressing for some of us here, (laughs) Why does this matter? Well, here's why it matters. Because in Psalms 90, it says, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Now, I know when you hear this, you think, oh my goodness, I I better get going. I don't have much time left. Now, I'm a lover, not a fighter. So I think I better get loving because I don't got a lot of time left to love. But the reason the Bible tells us to teach us to number our days isn't so we can be more productive. It's so we can prioritize what matters most. And the heart of wisdom here is saying, know what's most important, and that's living a life of love. And so how do you spell love? What is the way we do that? We've heard this many times. You spell love time. You show people time. But it's even more than that. It's time and commitments. It's time plus commitment is how we show people love, and it communicates love. The most important relationship in your life, the Bible says, is your relationship with God. And so if you know Jesus, it's making time and having a commitment to him to spend time with him every day, like Amy talked about. Working on your friendship with him. Listening to him. Talking to him. Letting him talk to you. Letting him love on you. It's making that commitment to be with him on a regular basis. Now, if you don't know Jesus here, but you're wondering, well, what is this relationship, this friendship I can have with God? I want you to know that after the service, you can go out to somewhere on the patio or the table, and you can talk to somebody about how to have a relationship with Jesus, how to start this relationship with him. Or you can ask the person who brought you. I know they would love to tell you. And you can begin the conversation about what does it mean to have a friendship with God. And then the second most important relationships we have that we need to have time and commitment for is for people. It's practicing presence around the people that we love, our people, our tribe, the ones that God has given us. You know, I've, as a pastor, I, I've, I've done a lot of memorials, and I've been to a lot of memorials as well. And I hear all kinds of testimonies. It's one of the, the best parts about a memorial is hearing about a person's life. But let me tell you something I've never heard. Never once have I ever heard this kind of testimony at a memorial. He was so amazing at his to-do lists. I've never heard that before. Because that's not what matters. What I've heard, though, is how this person impacted their life through relationships, how this person impacted their life because they gave of themselves, they gave of time, and they kept their commitments. But also some of the hardest stories to hear and some of the saddest are when you listen to adult children who are grieving over lost time and commitments from their parents. And it goes all the way back to when they were kids and all the way into an adulthood because as a parent, you never stop being a parent. And they're grieving over what could have been with their mom or their dad. I want to talk just a minute to you parents. If there's anything our teenagers and children need more than ever today is uninterrupted time with you. 
It's uninterrupted time with you as parents and for you as parents to keep your commitments, to keep your commitments to them above careers, above hobbies, above personal desires. And we need parents today to keep their commitments in their marriages and not st- and stop thinking. You need to stop thinking that divorce is the only option for what's going on in your marriage. In Orange County, we have a 68% divorce rate where we live right here. And statistically, there's no difference between Christians and non-Christians when it comes to this divorce rate. Folks, that's a problem. We're a people called to something greater, to a higher standard, because we have a God that can fix any problem and help you in any situation, whatever it is you're going through, no matter how hard it is, when you're willing to say, I'm going to keep what matters most, the main thing, and keep our commitments, God can work, and he does work in all kinds of situations, and especially in your marriage. Two of my heroes are friends of mine. I have so much respect for this couple, and here's why. My buddy's wife had a really bad affair on him, and she bravely came to him and confessed to him. And when she did, he didn't bail on the marriage. He chose her and he chose his kids. He chose to love in spite of the pain. He chose to forgive. And they both stepped into the mess together and they started cleaning it up. They chose love and forgiveness as the highest values. And they said, no matter what, we're gonna work it out. And they've worked hard on their marriage. They're still working on their marriage. But they're my heroes because they didn't give up. He stayed and she came home. Real men don't walk out when it gets hard. They walk in. They don't lean away from painful conversations, they lean in. Love runs to pain, not away from it. And our students and our families today and our communities and our churches need more of that kind of love and action than ever before to see what real love is and how it works. The stats in our valley of kids struggling with mental health is staggering. And while our churches are growing and our kids are having more and more and more and they've got the best education in the country right here, it doesn't matter because there's no program the church can offer. There's nothing the public sector can provide to take the place of you as a parent. It just can't happen. They need you. They need you. They need grandparents. They need single adults speaking into their life. Years ago, two very successful men based on the world standards, George McGovern and Chuck Colson, were on opposite ends of the political spectrum. Chuck Colson was with Nixon in the 72 presidential campaign. They both ended up with the same regrets when it came to time and family. Here's what Chuck Colson said. As I think back to my life, my biggest regret is not spending more time with my kids. Making family your top priority means going against a culture where materialism and workaholism are rampant. It means realizing that you may not advance as fast in your careers as some do. It means being willing to accept a lower standard of living, knowing you're doing the right thing for your children, giving them the emotional security they'll draw on for the rest of their lives. George McGovern, the one-time presidential candidate, wrote a book about his daughter, Terry, who died of alcoholism. In 1994, she was found frozen to death in a snowbank where she had collapsed in a drunken stupor. After his daughter had died, he poured over her diaries and contacted many of her friends. And he sadly discovered that he hadn't been the father he thought he'd been. While he'd been spending 18 hours a day working for political causes, Terry was writing in her diary that she missed her dad and that he probably didn't care about her anyways. McGovern's message to parents is this. Show more love for your kids by spending more time with them, especially teenagers, no matter what the cost is to your career. That way, he said, neither of you will have regrets. And he's quoted as saying this, I would give everything, and I mean everything, for one more afternoon with her. Just to tell her how much I loved her. And to have one of those happy times that we used to have too infrequently. We only have so much time. And we have a lot of things that I know that we want to get done and we even have dreams that we want to get done. But because we only have so much time, how we invest it and who we invest it into matters with our kids and our relationships and the people around us that we love. And I promise you, based on what God says, you will never regret choosing what matters most. It might mean cutting back. It might mean making some radical decisions in your home, but it'll be worth it. Look at Philippians 1.9, the last verse on your outline. 
This is our prayer for you, that your love will grow more and more and that you will have knowledge and understanding with love. Imagine with me just for a minute, what would our homes look like if we chose to grow in love more and more? What would our marriages be different? How would they be different if we would grow in love and make love what matters most in our marriage above everything else? How would our relationships be better if we would choose to forgive instead of holding grudges, if we would make amends quickly instead of letting them linger? How would our atmosphere at work be different for you as an employee or a boss or an owner if you said, you know what, no matter what product we're making or selling we're doing this is going to be an environment of love and respect and how would our churches look different how would we look different as a church if we made love and relationships top priority above programs or doing ministry or anything else that love and relationships would be the ministry and the top priority how would that change our community and how would that change us you will never regret making room for what matters most Never make room for love. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in a world that sends so many messages around us about what should be our priorities, what success looks like, what fulfillment looks like, thank you, Father, for clearing up all the confusion. Thank you for cutting straight through the noise and not just telling us in your word, but showing us through what Jesus did for us on the cross the ultimate sacrifice, the ultimate display of love. Thank you that you first loved us and because of that, you give us the capacity to be able to love others the way you have loved us. So help us all to grow more loving at home and with our relationships. Help us to be more patient. Help us to live a First Corinthians life because that's how you think of us. And no matter how busy we get and, and if we get off track, help us to get back and help us to remember that what matters most is love and to make room for relationships. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for checking out this message on YouTube. My name is Jay and I'm Saddleback's online campus pastor and I would love to invite you to join our online community. Here are three ways you can take a next step. First, learn more about belonging to our church family by completing Class 101 online. Second, don't do life alone anymore by getting into an online only small group that meets on platforms like Skype or learn more about hosting a group with your friends in your home. Third, join our global Facebook community to connect with others with the online community and be more engaged in the day to day. To take any of those next steps, visit saddleback.com online or email online at saddleback.com. Hope to hear from you soon.